We begin with breaking news tonight. A man robbed and shot the suspects on the run. We begin with breaking news from the city's south side. This is a live picture. It happened in the 600 block of West Pyron. That's near Pleasanton Road. The victim told police he was walking when confronted by two young men in a gray vehicle. He was found with a gunshot to his arm. Police are still trying to sort it all out tonight. Witnesses say they did not hear any gunfire. A new prediction models released when it comes to the COVID-19 crisis in Bear County. The data published for the first time online today. Two models from UTSA show our peak number of cases will be in mid-May. Predictive mathematical modeling shows a prediction of 3,600 cases through July, while another model predicts nearly 30,000. Let's take a look at the latest numbers from the county. Tonight, Bear County has 890 confirmed cases of COVID-19. That's an increase of 75 cases just since yesterday. The mayor saying the big jump in cases comes as they received a rush of test results. A bulk of federal results they were waiting for also came in. When breaking these numbers down, we see out of the 890 confirmed cases, 77 people are in the hospital. 147 have recovered from the illness and 37 people have died. The mayor saying 36 of those deaths were of people who had underlying health conditions. So what is expected to happen now? The night team Stephen Cavazos with what the city and county are saying to be prepared for. Stephen. Steve E.C. it's important to note that these models are subject to change daily, but city officials said today during, during today's daily briefing that just because we reach our local peak doesn't mean things will instantly return to normal. Wolf, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, Dr. Bear Don County Emmer, Judge Carmen Nelson Wolf, and Dr. Don Emmerich with Metro tonight, Health discussed how the models are helping them make future decisions. One model from consulting firm Oliver Wyman predicts a peak in late April with 1,700 cases. A model from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation also predicts the same, but with no estimated cases. However, two models from UTSA show our peak in mid-May. Predictive mathematical modeling shows a prediction of 3,600 cases through July. AI theoretical model of scenarios predicts nearly 30,000 cases. The mayor added there are plans to put together a health transition team to interpret that data to make sure the right protocols are in place when the city does reopen. But he was adamant that things won't be quick to return to normal. If anyone is under the assumption that all of a sudden we're going to flip a switch on May 1st, they're mistaken. That's not going to happen. What we want to make sure is that we've got the right ground rules in place from the public health medical perspective before we make those decisions. Now again, these models will change day to day, but that information will help narrow down when we will actually see our peak here in San Antonio. Now, Judge Nelson Wolf says emergency orders are also subject to change depending on the data that's collected. You can take a look at those models on our website at ksat.com. Steve Isis. Thank you, Stephen. It's already the site of a local COVID-19 outbreak. More than 100 residents and staff infected, and now we have learned the number of deaths at Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center increased to 17. Today, a list of allegations from County Commissioner Tommy Calvert led to a visit by state health officials and a Metro Health team. After that visit, Metro Health Director Dr. Don Emmerich said, while not perfect, there was, quote, nothing to the allegations, end quote. No issues with temperature. And when it came to allegations of short staff in the past, today Dr. Emmerich said the 15 members working were the exact amount that should be there. There were also claims of patients not being fed. Um, no, they actually interviewed 100% of the patients that were there and asked them to recall their last meals, and they were able to do so. In fact, there was food on their side table. As we've reported, it's not up to the city to regulate nursing homes. That's a job left to state and federal officials. Dr. Emmerich says they partnered with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission to check out those claims. Well, one disease is enough. While we're working to protect our families against COVID-19, doctors say we may be allowing one opportunity for an outbreak of other diseases. A university health system doctor tells Courtney Friedman if kids don't go to their wellness visits to get vaccines, it could be detrimental to other communities. 
Sarah Dickinson and her husband have two daughters, ages two and four months. Dickinson admits it's a scary time to have young children. Riley was born 10 weeks early, so obviously anything um, like this can be really dangerous for her. But even then, she took baby Riley to get her vaccinations yesterday. Vaccines are essential to prevent, you know, diseases such as mumps, um, you know, varicella, uh, measles, as well as whooping cough. So when we do still have outbreaks of measles and whooping coughs. Dr. Ileana Silva is a university health system pediatric director and wants parents to know vaccination well visits are categorized as essential for that reason. To make the appointment safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC and American Association of Pediatrics have made recommendations. To either, you know, schedule well child visits in the morning and then see sick visits in the afternoon so that way the populations don't mix or to have one side of the clinic dedicated to well visit with its own in entrance and exit. Parents are driving up so they can get screened for symptoms and get checked in all in their car instead of a waiting room. And when their appointment comes up, they get a call and walk in through a specific entrance. It was very limited interaction with people. And Dickinson I wants other parents to know her appointment was safe and necessary. I take um, it very seriously. I not only for my children to protect them, but to protect the other children in the community um, and other vulnerable people. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Dr. Silva says pediatricians are prioritizing visits that need vaccines for other regular checkups. Parents can use telemedicine, but Dr. Silva acknowledges some health insurance policies don't cover telemedicine for well child visits. If that's the case, call your doctor to see if it's necessary for your child to come in or postpone the visit until later. For weeks, students have been tapping into technology to keep up with school. Many districts, including the San Antonio Independent School District, handed out tablets and laptops. So far, SAISD has already distributed more than 23,000 new Chromebooks and another 17,000 devices. Internet service has come up, though, as an obstacle. So the SAISD Foundation is raising money to pay monthly service fees associated with broadband access. At Southside ISD, the district also helping students who are economically disadvantaged bridge the digital divide. Tiffany Huerta speaks with the district about how they are helping students stay connected well into the pandemic. I know that there was times where I go to school and that um, there was times where that was really not all I had to eat, but it was times where that was like the struggle meal. It hasn't always been easy for the Martinez family. I've been to pantries or things and felt kind of embarrassed at this place. You don't. Cheryl Martinez says her kids that go to Southside ISD schools have been getting free breakfast and lunch. I think that it's really amazing that our community is opening up and helping each other out in a situation like this. The district says since spring break to April 10th, they have served more than 40,000 meals. Southside ISD student Destiny Martinez is thankful for the resources given to her. They sent the Chromebooks and then they said that here soon that they were going to give us hotspots, which I thought was crazy. Since students were released for spring break in early March, they haven't returned back to school because of the coronavirus pandemic. The principal at Southside High School says their curriculum has not changed. We have um, what's called a year at a glance and, and really it outlines what we're going to be doing uh, each week of the semester. And so we have tried to still stay aligned with our year at a glance. Southside ISD has 6,000 students. The district has issued out more than 700 Chromebooks. Principal Demetria Sand says schools in the district are using Chromebooks to access instruction online, as well as their teachers who are facilitating their learning and providing support. The district spokesperson says today they received 500 Wi-Fi hotspots, and in just 12 hours, they had already received 150 requests from families. And I can see definitely in the future the need to integrate the instructional technology into our traditional classrooms um, and, and making that available, making that a mainstay because it, it is going to enhance instruction. Cheryl Martinez says they are thankful their children are not left behind during the coronavirus pandemic. I didn't know that there would be so much people working together to help the community and the kids. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News.
Well, let's take a look at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties tonight. Guadalupe County seeing an increase in cases for a total of 53. Hayes County jumping up to 109 tonight. Kendall County seeing an increase in cases with a total of 14. Comal County has 39 confirmed cases. Meanwhile, Atascosa County has nine cases. Medina County has 13. Wilson County reporting 12 cases and Bandera has two cases. Know your rights. State laws are protecting renters from eviction until the end of the month and federal laws protect those in public housing until the end of July. But the night team's Patty Santos tells us that doesn't mean you have the right to skip out on rent. People are being threatened with eviction when they've lost their jobs and they really have no hope of paying rent right now. Professor of Law Genevieve Fajardo says a notice to vacate is not the same thing as an eviction. If you are a tenant in San Antonio or anywhere in Texas, you cannot be removed from your house without a court order. In Bear County, eviction courts are closed until April 30th, and those who rent from landlords with federally backed mortgages are protected until July 25th. That is generally all public housing, Section 8 housing. That is any housing where there is a mortgage held by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, any type of um, federally backed mortgage. Keep in mind, there's no rent break. Your rent will be due once the protection is over or you will be evicted, but a help plan is in the works. We know people are, are, are scared, they're frustrated, uh, but we're, we're going to do everything we can to help people stay in their homes. San Antonio Councilman Roberto Trevino says nearly half of the city rents. The city is funneling money to renters assistance programs and a renters commission is being considered to protect families beyond the stay home stay safe order. But with more than 4,100 calls to the city weekly for help through the risk mitigation fund, there's no guarantee. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. It's still hit on the night beat pawn shops in the pandemic. What they are now noticing is San Antonians grapple with the crisis. And your San Antonio questions answered. We brought together a panel of experts. Highlights from tonight's virtual town hall coming up. And we meet the local woman behind a mask designed to be better than an N95. Next on the night. Some breaking news for you right now. Sky 12 over the scene at this hour of a major accident on the 11,000 block of I-37 South near Highway 181. As you can see there, emergency crews are on scene. It is causing a little bit of a traffic backup, but uh, that one car there seems to be in bad shape. We do not know the details and the specifics of what exactly transpired here. We've just been told it is a major accident. Obviously, it's uh, going to be affecting uh, the roadways there for some time, but uh, emergency crews there are on scene and we will continue to monitor it, to monitor it through Sky 12. It is a mask designed to be better than the FDA approved N95 mask used primarily by medical staff amid the pandemic. We first heard about the effort last night in our San Antonio question segment. Tonight we speak with the local chief nurse executive behind that creation. As the night team's Jaffney Gray reports, the design developed from air conditioning filters. Um, Hearing the stories for, from the nurses in New York and other hot spots, it just was heartbreaking. University Health System Chief Nurse Executive Tommy Austin has spent over three weeks with her staff and the Southwest Research Institute designing her own spin to an N95 mask, a mask that's already been proven to eliminate at least 95% of viruses and bacteria trying to get through, according to UHS. Making sure that we've not just developed something that we think is, is a good product, but something that we know is a good product by using science. With the purchase of an AC filter, Austin designed an N99 mask tested by the Southwest Research Institute to have a 99.5 filtration efficiency using one material. She also designed an N97 mask with a 97.8 filtration efficiency using another material. As you can see, it's under my chin securely. I don't feel any air coming across the top. It doesn't a bit have uh, what we call carbon dioxide buildup, which can make you dizzy or have a headache. It actually is very comfortable. The hospital currently has enough N95 masks and personal protection equipment, but she says with the surge of COVID-19 patients predicted to happen in May, they wanted to have a backup plan. 
We are also sharing our design with the other facilities here in San Antonio and whomever needs the design. I've also shared it with uh, Sutter Health in California. So far, they've created 600 masks and hope to produce 6,500 more. As a nurse, we are to be advocates for people. And so my primary goal was not to be uh, rich or anything in regard in, in regards to this mask. The, the main the main purpose of this mask was to keep people safe. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Keep people safe. By the way, the Southwest Research Institute worked with Dr. Austin as part of that development of that mask, and they were also part of a panel discussion during tonight's first SAQ virtual town hall. And speaking of that, tonight's panel was brought together, and it's the top minds in bioscience. It also included UT Health San Antonio, the Texas Biomedical Research Institute, UTSA and BioBridge Global. How the panel answered some of your coronavirus questions coming up later in this newscast. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam 61 degrees out there. Oh, today was just a beautiful day. Hope everybody at least got to open the windows or stand outside for a bit and enjoy it. Yeah, you know, did you hear Adam seem like he took a deep breath there? <laughs> I think maybe he's getting whimsical about how nice yeah. the weather's been. Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. Just taking it all in, you know, taking it all in because these days and how beautiful they are, are numbered. We know that. I wish we could just bottle them up and then take them back out whenever we wanted them come, you know, July or August around here. And I do want to point out, we're going to have some pretty big temperature fluctuations in the days ahead. I mean, we'll be in the 70s the next couple of days, but then look what happens on Saturday. We drop down into the low 60s, maybe even a bit cooler across San Antonio and most of South Texas as a cold front and will be affecting us. And then next week, we're well into the 80s, even flirting with 90 degrees. So let's talk about today. We started off at 45 degrees. All right, so well below average for this time of year. Then this afternoon, we made it to 68, where the average high is 80. Right now, we're in the 50s. Some locations at 60, Castroville and even 60, 61 at the airport in San Antonio. And otherwise, for the most part, we're in the 50s, Canyon Lake at 60 degrees, but Rock Springs at 54. So fairly similar temperatures across South Texas at this hour. Now, let's talk about tomorrow morning. It's going to be unseasonably cool again, but not as cold as what we had earlier today. So we're talking 48 here in San Antonio, mid 40s in the hill country, which is about 10 degrees warmer than what we had earlier today. Yeah, we had readings in the mid to upper 30s across the hill country this morning. So not as cold tomorrow, but still kind of fall like out there by the afternoon. Beautiful day. We warm up nicely well into the 70s for high temperatures with a mixture of sun and clouds. You'll, you will notice a little increase in the cloud cover, but comfortable overall. Another day to just ah, take that deep breath, right? And here's the good thing. If you want to open your windows, Mold was moderate today and oak was moderate. I know that may sound elevated, but it's not. It's significantly lower in terms of the uh, pollen counts than the past several days and several weeks, to be honest with you. Dew points, not bad. Still in the low 40s, mid 40s in spots as well. And that means a lack of mugginess in the air. That's going to be changing, though, as we get into tomorrow night and first thing Friday. And actually, I think we could squeeze some of that moisture out of the air as we get into Friday. Quiet weather pattern right now. You look across the state, actually, most of the nation is fairly quiet until you get to the parts of the northern Rocky Mountains where they've got some snow going on there. Quiet for now, but we are expecting a cold front to really brew to the north of us and push our way and make it here by early afternoon on Friday. So tomorrow, we'll just have a mixture of sun and clouds. Another beautiful day, a few degrees warmer than what we had today. Then we get into Friday, and the main headline is the dreariness. Low gray clouds, a little bit of dampness periodically, but not a whole lot of real meaningful and appreciable rain. Take a look at the future cast here. Cold front moves in early afternoon, and maybe a thin line of light rain will develop somewhere across South Texas and our area, but we're not expecting much really to materialize from this system. So yeah, gray and somewhat damp, but not a whole lot to show for it. Just some isolated light showers Friday and into Saturday, I think we'll see more of that activity. All right, so here's your forecast for tomorrow. In the morning, we'll start at 48, unseasonably cool, but a comfortable 77 by the afternoon. And you're not gonna notice the humidity until early Friday morning and the cold front hits sweeps away the humidity for 
the upcoming weekend. And notice that temperature drop Saturday down closer to 60 for the high temperature. Then we get into next week with some sunshine and we're back well into the 80s. As for those rain chances, just some isolated light showers Friday, Saturday and Saturday night into early Sunday. We could have a few scattered storms here and there. We'll have another update coming up next half hour. See you then. All right, we'll see you, Adam. Thank you so much. All right, well, he's not talking to his players, but he is still per persuasive, Greg. Yeah, this is a pop pep talk, and it's going towards the folks of the San Antonio Food Bank who have done an incredible job during this COVID-19 pandemic. And more importantly, they've been under also a lot of stress. But look who calls in to give them a pep talk. It is Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, the food bank very near and dear to his heart. But what a great job those staffers are doing. And a ranger, Smithson Valley Rangers, coming home, coming up. San Antonio Food Bank getting recognition for their work to feed families in San Antonio and the surrounding communities from around the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. Who could forget the pictures captured by Sky 12 over Traders Village where 10,000 people showed up in cars in line to get food for their families after many businesses have been forced to shut down, furloughing and firing employees in the process. It's been a daunting task for the San Antonio Food Bank workers and volunteers. And just days after their biggest event so far, they received a pep talk from Pop. San Antonio Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, who was a huge supporter of the food bank, took time Time out to appear on a conference call and give workers words of encouragement. Food Bank President and CEO Eric Cooper was on that conference call, first reported by our friend Tom Orsborn over the San Antonio Express News, and so was Michael Guerra, the San Antonio Food Bank Chief Development Officer. Pop had great tips. He had he had tips for just what do you do when when it gets tough? How do you hang in there? He gave stories of, of the team when they faced adversity, um, you know, losing out on a series when they should have been the world champions and everybody staying together and fighting to come back the next time. He told stories of humor, of how they kept it light and kept each other supported. Um, every story he told was like nourishment for our team, just to strengthen us for this next half as we go through this fight. And they need your help more than ever now. And if you'd like to donate, just go to safoodbank.org slash donate and help out now. Our San Antonio Spurs are supposed to close out their regular season tonight at home against the New Orleans Pelicans. But that did not happen. As a result, it is one of 19 games called off by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the Spurs, like the rest of the NBA, wait and see if the season has restarted after it was shut down by Commissioner Adam Silver back on March the 11th. After Rudy Gorbert tested positive for coronavirus before the Utah Jazz game against the Oklahoma City Thunder, officials and medical personnel have a plan in place to restart the season in just 25 days, with 11 days of isolated workouts followed by a two-week training camp before resuming the season. The biggest question now is if the season is restarted, would it include regular season or just postseason games? That decision, according to Commissioner Silver, will not be made until May the 1st. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Count the President of the United States, Donald Trump, as one who wants to get not only the country, but sports started up again and tells us he will unveil his plan later this week. Before that announcement, President Trump says he will consult with Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, Patriots owner Robert Kraft, Mavericks owner Mark Cuban. Unlike the NBA, the NFL is hoping for no interruption in their season set to start this September, while the draft scheduled for Las Vegas has had to be shifted to an in-house, but still on for April the 23rd okay, with team so facilities still closed. Cuban has been one of the more optimistic owners about restarting the NBA season that was scheduled to begin the postseason this weekend. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the nation's top infectious disease expert, says the only way professional sports will return this summer is without fans. Major League Baseball has already been discussing a plan where players will be sequestered in hotels in Arizona and games will be played at Chase Field and surrounding spring training facilities without fans. Speaking on Snapchat with Peter Hanby, Dr. Fauci also says the players would have to be tested every week. The PGA was one of the first of the major sports to shut down. Now maybe one of the first to start up again. The PGA Tour is expected to announce that it will resume competition on June the 11th through the 14th at the Charles Schwab Challenge at the Colonial Country Club in Fort Worth. That's according to Golf Digest. It also reports that no fans will be allowed to attend the tournament. The PGA canceled the Valero Texas Open scheduled for April the 2nd through the 5th at the JW Marriott TPC Resort course here in San Antonio and has not staged a tour event until now. It's official, a former Smithson Valley star quarterback coming home to play football. Next. New 
UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer has confirmed today that former Smith Valley quarterback Josh Atkins has been added to the Roadrunners 2020 signing class. Atkins signed his financial agreement today, will join the Roadrunners after he earns his undergraduate degree from New Mexico State this summer and will be immediately eligible to play this fall with two years of eligibility left. Josh, who is a three-year starter for the Rangers, where he threw for a program leading 6,831 yards and 66 touchdowns in the air to go along with his over 1,000 yards on the ground and another 34 touchdowns. Now Josh gets to come home and play in front of family and friends who are thrilled he is playing football again in San Antonio. It was awesome. You know, they've been excited. I mean, even in the high school, you know, that was somewhere that they wanted to see me go. Mm -hmm. And if other things played out differently, maybe that would have been where I would, would have gone. But, you know, having the opportunity to come back, it was it just kind of, it, God kind of puzzled it and pieced it in the perfect way. And um, my parents were ecstatic when, I, when they found out that I was coming home. By signing Atkins today, it pushes Trailer's 2020 class to a total of 18. And what it does also is give them a bona fide chance of getting a real, true, died in the wool starting quarterback for the Roadrunners with Frank Harris being off and on injured. It'll be a great competition to start this fall. Yeah, two local kids. You got it. All right, thank you, Greg. We still ahead, highlights of our first virtual town hall with San Antonio's questions for bioscience and medical experts coming up. I want to go back to some late breaking news we've been following from I-37 southbound near Highway 181. We have a crew heading this way. That crew is actually telling us that traffic started to be closed down after you get past Loop 410. When you're heading south on 37, you get past Loop 410. That's where traffic is backing up and they're closing down the road. Still no word on any injuries, but you can see at least two vehicles are involved. We're continuing to monitor the situation out here. Well, the number of COVID-19 cases worldwide now topping 2 million. In the United States, more than 30,000 reported deaths from the novel coronavirus, 2,500 in just the past 24 hours. Still, there are signs of hope. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez has the latest. President Trump set to announce today, plans Thursday the for House. reopening the country. We'll be opening up states, some states much sooner than others. And we think some of the states can actually open up before the deadline of May 1st. And I think that that will be a very exciting time indeed. The president saying data suggests that nationwide we've passed the peak on new COVID-19 cases. His task force clarifying the danger from this pandemic is far seeing. from over. So over the last five to six days, we've seen declines in cases across the country. And this has been very in reassuring for us. Um, at the same time, we know that mortality and the fatalities that we're facing across the United States continue. In Massachusetts, the number of cases and rising. Say at this point in time that we are in the surge. And in New York, the location of nearly a third of the country's coronavirus related deaths, the curve now flattening, but at a devastatingly high level. The governor echoing concerns that testing needs to be more widely available before or it's safe to reopen businesses, as some European countries have. The more testing, the more open the economy. But uh, there's not enough national capacity to do this. Even with more testing, Dr. Anthony Fauci tells our David Muir an eventual and, and, and second and, and wave uh, of infection be could be possible. That we do not know everything about this virus and what it's capable of doing. It is entirely conceivable that we will see a rebound as we get into a seasonal situation such as next fall or winter. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Pawn shops and the pandemic. They're seeing a steady flow of customers all trying to buy items that would keep families entertained while staying at home. Some are also trying to bring in money after experiencing a loss in work. Managers we spoke with say some families are selling more of their jewelry to bring in the extra cash. Workers at Bill's Pawn and Jewelry say as workers, they're doing what they can to be safe. Uh, we are trying to keep everybody safe. We have our staff here wearing masks. We're cleaning all the time and have hand sanitizer. So we're doing the best we can to stay in operation and, um, and survive here. We also, she also added that they have limited customer browsing.
Well, it seems the COVID-19 pandemic has led to fewer people drinking and driving. Both SAPD and BCSO are reporting a lot less DWI arrests in our area. But as Devin Clark reports, that doesn't necessarily mean people are drinking less. DWI arrests have decreased in the area since March 18th. It's when the COVID-19 pandemic led to an emergency order which closed bars and restaurant dining rooms in San Antonio. But not just that, you know, a lot of uh, different festivities have been canceled. Uh, you got weddings, you got birthday parties. Uh, you have sporting events. Between March 18th and April 13th, Officer Doug Green with the San Antonio Police Department says officers made 147 DWI arrests. Compare that to the 25 days prior to the mayor's order, where SAPD reports 318 DWI related arrests. But uh, nonetheless, you see that we had 147 arrests. So that still shows you that people are still out there making. Uh, poor decisions to to drink and drive. The Bear County Sheriff's Office also seeing a huge decrease between March 18th and April 13th. BCSO deputies made 20 DWI related arrests. Compare that to 60 DWI related arrests in the 25 days prior to the order. The lower DWI numbers don't necessarily mean that people are drinking less. For example, here on San Pedro, the beer and all which sells to go drinks still seeing lines at the drive through right across the street at the reggae bar. We are really specialized in Caribbean food. Owner Kevin Hogan says some people are still getting drinks to go with their meals. Frozen drinks are set up with 350 milliliter small bottles that you can mix at home. The future of dining in is still cloudy, but SAPD has a clear message for the public. COVID-19 is putting a, a halt to, to many things in our life right now. Uh, but it will not prevent you from taking a trip to, their, to jail if you decide to drink and drive. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. What happens in San Antonio often changes the world. That's a quote from Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who spoke tonight about efforts by San Antonio's bioscience companies being made here to combat the coronavirus pandemic. The mayor joined by a panel of esteemed medical and bioscience experts working right here in the Alamo City, all part of our first SAQ virtual town hall, where we took questions asked by you, our viewers, and went looking for answers. Here's a little bit of it. So what is the vaccine? So there are basically two kinds of vaccines that are being developed. One is a uh, includes pieces of the virus itself. So it's either proteins or RNA of the virus that you'd inject into the arm of someone or maybe put a patch on the skin. The other is to actually make an inactive COVID-19 virus that doesn't cause infection. The, the, the unique part of COVID-19 is that a lot of the, the issues that our patients see is from the inflammation. And um, the unique part of our cells that we're looking at ramping up is that it tamps down inflammation. So we're really hoping that we can come up with a, a real novel therapeutic that can really target what is uh, causing issues for those patients. What is slash are the biggest obstacles right now, industry and medical, to finding potential treatments and a vaccine for COVID-19? I think the obstacles really get down to safety and efficacy. Um, we really do need the clinical trials. Um, these trials allow for us to directly compare the effect of any new therapy or vaccine relative to a so-called control group um, in a variety of individuals to really demonstrate that a given therapy is specific, safe, and works well uh, for COVID-19. That's critical in clinical trial studies, and it takes time and money to organize those trials. Do you have any answers why the United States isn't ramping up test kits when it comes to COVID to detecting COVID-19? Well, I mean, my understanding is that they are, but there has been such a pent up demand for these tests that we're basically cities competing against cities for uh, very precious few resources. Uh, and, and what Dr. Schlesinger mentioned is true. We've heard reports of, of peer cities who are just going out there by themselves purchasing tests, test kits that have not been validated, uh, that have not been approved, and they come back with 66 percent uh, accuracy readings, which can complicate the whole matter of trying to contain the virus. Will the people who did not contract COVID-19 be the so-called second wave that we're hearing about of infections? And do you think as a medical community and a biotech community that we're ready for a second wave or will be ready for a second wave? But it appears that at least of right now that our surge is flattened 
but that does mean that we're always at risk for increased infections down the road. So we've gonna, go, we're gonna have to maintain our vigilance in this area. And that's something we'll really have to continue to address as a community in how we keep doing that over time, but also try to return to some normal, normalcy in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, doctor. There were many other questions our panel covered during tonight's town hall. You can check out tonight's virtual event in its entirety right now on KSAT.com. It's still ahead. Many high school seniors missed out on prom. What about graduation? What some local school districts are hoping to get done to mark the milestone. And court staff are using this time to get ahead of what's to come after the pandemic. Coming up, we'll tell you about the preparations to get juries going. I think that's the wrong video. That was from our panel we just talked about. Plus, the defenders take a look at a cadet class with the Bear County Sheriff's Office and a teacher who tested positive for COVID-19. It's next on the night beat. A Bear County Sheriff's Department officials confirming a dispatcher who tested positive for COVID-19 taught a cadet class at the agency's academy the same day she was sent home because of exposure to a sick family member. As Dylan Collier reports, at least 13 cadets from that class have now contracted the virus and the entire group remains on leave. <laughs> As they attempt to stop the spread, a phrase officials have thrown out there a lot in recent weeks, it's become quite clear that any plan would need to extend beyond the jail itself. And those are very dangerous signs. Judge Nelson Wolf on Easter Sunday spent several minutes addressing the public about safeguards put in place to hopefully minimize the presence of COVID-19 at the Bear County Jail. But now comes confirmation that a major exposure incident for BCSO staff happened elsewhere late last month at its training academy on Herring Road. A department spokesperson releasing a statement that a dispatcher taught a cadet class March 31st, then was sent home later that same day after revealing a member of their household was sick. That dispatcher and at least 13 of the cadets they taught have now tested positive for the coronavirus. That's well over half the class. BCSO says cadet classes continue, but have now been broken down into groups of eight. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The BCSO officials previously said possible exposure to people inside the jail was minimized because they placed the entire cadet class alpha on leave after the first cadet tested positive. This afternoon, the sheriff's office released a statement saying six more detention officers had tested positive for COVID-19. That brings the total number of deputies who tested positive to 20. Eight inmates have also tested positive, along with four other civilian employees. Bear County officials preparing the jury system so they can get it up and running once this pandemic is over. The system was shut down last month after fears of having too many people in one place. Administrative Judge Ron Ron Hell and Chief Bailiff Julieta Schultz have been putting together a plan for reopening the jury room. Initially, jurors could be required to wear masks. Social distancing is also expected to be part of it. Social distancing is still going to be a great part of our society um, when we open up. If we practice social distancing in this jury room, instead of 650, we could accommodate maybe at most 100. 100 is barely enough to cover one felony jury trial. That means the system will likely be getting off to a slow start. Right now, the target date to get this going is May 15th. And just a reminder, starting Monday, we will be rebroadcasting all of the 2019 Fiesta Parades, starting with the Texas Cavaliers River Parade. It is our way of keeping the Fiesta spirit alive. Here's a look at the full schedule. You can also find it online at ksat.com. And while you're there, don't forget to upload your favorite Fiesta picks. I know I'm going to do that. Are you going to yeah. do that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> now let's go ahead and check in with Adam Kasky with our weather. And you know what, Adam? Tonight, yes. or excuse me, tomorrow would have been yes. Fiesta Fiesta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is why I was just talking to the kids earlier before bedtime saying tomorrow we're going to have some fun at 5 and 6 p.m. We're popping the confetti cannon in the house. <laughs>
<laughs> it's going to be a good time. We're going to we're going to have fiesta at home this April, right? I know it's postponed till November, but we're going to make the best of it and still have some fun. You're going to want to tune in. This is going to be good. My wife's not too excited about all the I was going to ask, did you clear did you clear this, Four to did you one, clear honey. this with the wife? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. It was more of a comment than a question. <laughs> it's more of a statement of what we're doing tomorrow. Uh, I'm good at cleaning it up. All right, so anyway, let's talk about our weather here. Not quite as cold tonight as what we had last night. I mean, we were in the 30s in the hill country early this morning, where it's not gonna be that cold, but still below average. We do have another cold front to talk about, and that's gonna give us some gray and dreary weather with a little bit of rain, uh, especially by Friday and Saturday. Don't expect a whole lot of rain, but just some. So let's talk temperatures first. You get up in the Panhandle and we're in the 40s and you get down into South Texas, still some 60s there. But locally, I, the majority of us are in the 50s right now. Kerrville, 52 degrees, Pleasanton, 56 and even Carrizo Springs right now at 57. All right. So looking at our dew points, they're in the 40s. So it's comfortable outside. We are not muggy. We're not feeling the humidity, at least not now. This is going to change a bit as we get into tomorrow night and first thing on Friday. Here's our future cast. So we're going to start this tomorrow morning. Not all that muggy through the day. We will have a southeasterly wind, but it's not going to have enough time for uh, to really boost that humidity through the day that you'll feel it. It's by Friday morning. You'll notice that stickiness in the air until our next cold front arrives by Friday afternoon, and that's going to sweep away the humidity, but also give us the chance for a few showers here and there. But don't get your hopes up for really good soaking rainfall. Here's a look at our rain chances. 20% by Friday, 30% on Saturday. Those are just some spotty light showers. And we could have some scattered thunderstorms Saturday night into Sunday morning. So that's a 40% chance, some scattered activity. 48 tomorrow morning, 70 at noon, and a beautiful 77 for our high temperature. Good amount of sunshine with some increasing clouds throughout the day tomorrow. All right, look at temperatures, especially as we get into the weekend. So 70s the next couple of days, but by Saturday with that cold front, we're down in the lower 60s for highs. And honestly, that may be a little generous. We may even be cooler than that. And then next week, we rebound back into the 80s and maybe even near 90 degrees. All right, five and six o'clock. It's gonna be a two camera live shot from the Kasky house. A lot of confetti. Ooh, Join the fancy. party. We'll see you I, I, You know, I'm a little afraid for your house <laughs> just because I know that there's still places in San Antonio where they have little wedges, little things of confetti wedged into the ceiling oh, still. Oh my goodness. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yep, have a good night. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Still ahead, what are prospective college students facing and how are universities changing their selection process amid the pandemic? Plus, several local high school seniors left wondering if their graduation may be the next event that will fall victim to COVID-19. What some of the districts are hoping to do to keep that from happening. Next. Think about it. When they left for spring break, they never imagined they wouldn't be able to go back to their schools to wrap up their senior year. Senior trips and proms have been canceled and some fear graduation may be next. Alicia Barrera reached out to local school districts to find out the fate of graduation for the class of 2020. State competitions, prom, senior trips and traditions canceled. Because these are once in a lifetime moments that, have, that are, are just banished. In an instant. So we didn't get senior year prom, juniors didn't get their prom. Um, I think we're canceling a senior sunset, which was just like a, a cookout on the field the last day of school. Liana Noriega is a Johnson High School senior. She doesn't know if she'll be able to celebrate her accomplishments as she imagined on May 31st of this year. The venue we were going to use for graduation is now a COVID-19 like, temporary hospital. So... Uh, we can't use that anymore. That's why NEISD is looking into rescheduling or even hosting the ceremony online. A virtual graduation requires a great deal of time and planning to prepare. So 
I wanted you to know we are beginning the process in case we are unable to gather for graduation. Other school districts, including Edgewood, Southside, Alamo Heights, South San Antonio, and Northside ISD are still working to determine how their class of 2020 will be honored. And we certainly want to do that, which is why we have not rushed into making any final decision. At this point, it is still our hope that we would be able to provide a, a live and in-person graduation as you as you typically would see. Somerset ISD has two graduations to plan for. Their options include rescheduling or taking things outdoors. We're going to revert back to the old school way, how we used to do it in Somerset. We're going to be in Bulldog Stadium, and it might be hot, it might be sweaty and sticky in late July, but uh, the seniors of uh, our Somerset High School class of 2020, they, they deserve it. For school districts wanting to reschedule in locations like the Freeman Coliseum, the problem is booking consecutive days in the summer. And EISD says it wasn't possible for them. Now the next step is to plan for cap and gown deliveries. That's set to look a lot like the meal drop-offs we've seen. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Well, many students already sent in their college applications before the pandemic took shape and schools across the country are reacting accordingly. Many have pushed back deadlines. School counselors tell us many universities are also taking the pandemic into account when it comes to the requirements needed for school. With taking what an official transcript would be or, or waiting for test scores, um, they're looking at students in a holistic manner. Michael Buck is a high school senior and is deciding between two schools. He's doing what he can with virtual tours and talking to current students before making a decision. We'll be right back. Well, check this out. They are based in Nevada and the U.S. Air Force's Thunderbirds performed a flyover above every hospital in the Las Vegas Valley on Saturday. This view from the cockpit shows the squadron then flying next to the famed Las Vegas Strip. The hope was to recognize first responders, healthcare professionals and other workers who are on the front lines battling the coronavirus pandemic. That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 430. Good night.